Well, good day and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Uh, I trust you're enjoying the change of weather as our, our evenings get cooler and cooler. It reminds me that uh, things don't last forever. We have seasons uh, that we deal with with our weather, but also there are seasons in our life. And uh, the Bible series that we're going through right now was a special season in the life of Jesus' ministry. As we shared with you several weeks ago, Jesus had been uh, traveling with a, a few of the men that would eventually become his disciples his first year. And then his cousin, John, who we know as John the Baptist, got arrested. And at that point, Jesus' ministry basically gets really launched. He goes full time at that point. He calls his disciples. And one of the first things he does after calling his disciples, and we got to remember, while we, we know of the 12 disciples, there were many others that were following him. And how do we know that? Well, when they went to replace Judas um, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, one of the criteria of the person that was going to be selected to replace Judas had to have been there throughout Jesus' ministry. So, and there were two individuals that are actually named in the book of Acts chapter 1. So we know that there were many others that were following Jesus, whether they were full-time, part-time, we don't know, but we know that they were there from the beginning. So when Jesus calls out his 12, these are the special 12. These are the ones that he's going to spend uh, more time with in terms of mentoring them and helping them understand. But we know that most of Jesus' ministry, uh, particularly the second and third year of Jesus' ministry, he had large groups that were following him. And so one of the first things he does after he calls out and selects his 12 disciples is he sits down and he begins to teach them about what God's kingdom is all about. Uh, and what we've seen thus far is it's very different from the religious life that had been uh, communicated throughout uh, the, the, the disciples' lives. In other words, they're seeing the kingdom from a very different perspective. See, Jesus was telling his disciples that their righteousness needed to be more than just what you do and what you say, but includes your thoughts and your motives. That in God's kingdom, our motivation is as important as what we do and say. And here's the key verse there. Uh, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And so last week, we, we spent quite a bit of time looking at giving and praying as it relates to what this verse is communicating. But the key for your life and my life is that God cares about things and that there is a reward on, on how we live our life. It's not a reward of we get into heaven or we don't get into heaven. It's a reward of just what we've done to contribute to those around us, to contribute to things that heaven values. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That should be our motivation, just like the Lord's Prayer teaches us. And we looked at that last week. So he warns them, be careful that you don't practice like those. And he was actually kind of doing a little dig here to the Pharisees. And but he calls them hypocrites who do things to be seen. It's not about whether they have the right motivation or not. They got the wrong motivation. It's all about, so I get applause. I get uh, recognized. Um, so he calls them hypocrites because they're motivated by vanity, pride, and applause from others. But in contrast, Jesus said, my followers are motivated by humility. They do their deeds in secret. They're, they, don't, they don't care. Again, as I said, it's not whether someone recognizes you or not. The question is, what was your motivation? If your motivation was to be recognized, Jesus is saying, you have your reward. But there's no reward in heaven. You receive the applause. And, and this becomes very difficult because uh, 
we don't know everyone's motivation. We only see what people do. And so what God is saying is, I, I see the heart. Um, this is illustrated in the Old Testament when Samuel was looking for the replacement to Saul, King Saul. And he sent to Jesse's house, and Jesse has a number of boys, and he, Samuel's going through, and he says, oh, he, he'd be good, a good possibility. And God says, no, no. You're looking at the external. You're you're making judgment based on what you see, but I see the heart, and, and there's another boy. And so he finds out that David's been taking care of sheep. He brings him in, and God says, that's, that's the man. That's the one I want to replace Saul. Well, we have the same issue. We see, we make judgments. Sometimes we get it right. A lot of times we get it wrong. But what God does is he, seeing, he sees the heart. He sees what motivates us. You know, sometimes we mess up, okay, for, but our motivation was good. Um, sometimes we have a heart for God, but we mess up, okay? And God sees that heart, and I'm so grateful that he does, but that's also scary, it's also scary because it gets to the heart of what leads to our actions. See, our attitudes and our thoughts precede what we do. And so God and Jesus' words are getting to the heart of your life and my life. So, as we said, last week we looked at giving. Do we give to be seen? Do we pray to be seen? Okay. The, again, the problem with these, these disciplines, and by the way, these are good things that you and I need to be doing. We need to be giving people. We need to be generous. We need to be praying people. Okay. They always have the danger of spiritual pride. It begins in our heart. We feel superior because we've checked off all the boxes. We feel superior because maybe we're aware of the fact that we have time to do, do these things or we have the means to give these things and we're just saying, wow, isn't this something? No. Whatever you and I have is given to us by God, so it's our response to a giving God. Um, the other mo thing that motivates us, you know, that spiritual pride besides that we feel superior is that we're seeking affirmation. We want to receive the applause of others. We want to be affirmed. And that's a good thing when taken in, in properly. But it can be a bad thing when it's all about the applause of others. Why do I do what I do? Why do I say what I do? You know, I, I listen to, you know, political speeches and I listen to people, uh, other preachers. And, and I, I, I look for how do they present themselves? Are they presenting themselves in order to speak to the hearts of people and the minds of people? Or are they doing it to be affirmed? It's kind of like watching um, a political speech. We'll, we'll, we'll stay in the, the politics area now. And you've got a whole room full of your supporters. Do you think that what you say and how you say it is different than if you had a mixed group there that had opposing point of view, okay? what motivates us? Okay? And so we, we, we want to be affirmed and uh, maybe we don't care about those who oppose us. And so we're gonna say things that we know will just get people excited and motivated, right? Seeking affirmation can uh, be a, a deadly thing in our lives. And so Jesus is saying, one, be careful that when you do your deeds, when you do your practice and righteousness, that you don't do it to be seen by others, but you do it as unto the Lord. So we didn't get to this last one because Jesus uses three analogies. He talks about giving. He talks about praying. Now he talks about fasting. And I'm going to spend just a moment here. But one of the things that becomes important here is that fasting is a spiritual discipline. Remember, Jesus is assuming people are doing these things already. And he says, not if you do them, but when you do them. Okay, so how did the disciples do that? What did they do in the times? Well, let's talk about what Jesus said here. When you fast, 
do not look somber as the hypocrites do. In other words, you're withered and oh, you're in deep uh, physical stress, you know, because you're, you know, you're going through and just really giving yourself and laboring and, okay. In other words, your appearance shouldn't be any different when you're fasting than when you're not fasting. And he says, those who do this, well, they receive their reward in full. Why? Because people are recognizing him and says, wow, I couldn't do that, but he must be a real spiritual or she must be a real spiritual person because look, they're, they're, they're so intense in their walk with God and their fasting that it's, it's having even a, an impact on their physical countenance. Okay. But Jesus goes on to say, well, let me just say here fast. The Pharisees fasted two days a week, Mondays and Thursday. And they thought it drew God's attention and wanted others to know about their appearance or know by their appearance that they were fasting, that they were being good, good Jewish um, people. Okay. And they also saw that fasting was a way of getting God's attention. But in reality, that's not the intention of fasting at all. And here's what Jesus said. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. In other words, take a shower so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting. Okay. But only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay. So remember, we talked about there's rewards here. The question is, are the rewards on this side of eternity where we receive the war, the the reward and the applause of people or is on the other side of eternity where we receive God's commendation because we made a difference in this life. So again, Jesus assumed his followers were fasting. The early church fasted. Now, now for those who may not come from traditions where fasting is discussed, let me just in 30 seconds, give give a summary of what fasting is. It's it's the deliberate abstaining from food for spiritual reasons. It's not dieting. In other words, instead of eating, we're praying. Instead, of, we're doing something that has a spiritual uh, component to it. It's not for our benefit. It's because we want to give set aside time and we want to hear from God. See, there were several types of fasting in Scripture. There were absolute fasts, which typically happened for several days. Um, there's the fasting where there's no solids or liquids, just water. Okay, and then many times those would go many more days. And then there were partial fasts. We know that from the book of Daniel, that he had a partial fast. There were things that he removed from his diet that the, the Babylonian captors wanted him to do. And he, he restricted his diet, whatever type of fast. And again, if you have health issues, you, you probably need to consult your doctor to see the type of fast. If you, this is something you want to do that you you can handle, because as we get older, um, it, it's, it may be more difficult uh, for certain types of fast. But the point is, is that there's fasting in scripture. Whatever you do, don't be legalistic about it. This is not about changing God or telling God how uh, how awesome you are because you're fasting. That's not the intent of it. It's about preparing our hearts for what God's going to do. It changes us. It changes us. I've been on several fasts, and when I do that, typically there was a need. Uh, there was something that I, I really wanted to hear from God on. It wasn't about getting God to do what I wanted him to do. And so I'm going to put the pressure on and twist his arm by fasting. That's not the purpose of fasting. It's preparing my heart for what God wants to do in and through me. So Jesus continues his teaching after talking about giving and praying and fasting. He continues his teaching and challenging his followers to be different. And again, I said at the very beginning, if I, I could summarize in just a few words what this series of teachings called the Sermon on the Mount is all about, is that we are called to be different. We are called to be different from the world's value system. And, and in this case, also the religious value system that Jesus and his followers were confronted by 
uh, exemplified in the Pharisees. He's called us to be people of light versus darkness. Remember, he says, you are salt, you are light. And it's interesting that when you read John's gospel or you read 1 John, he talks quite a bit about the fact that we are light in a dark world. And that we need to let our light so shine that they may see our deeds. Not, we don't do the deeds to be seen, but they see our deeds. And who gets the honor and glory? It's not about our applause to us. It's our Heavenly Father receives all honor and glory. Now he's going to call us to a life of simplicity in the world that focuses on materialism. Now, you would think that materialism is a 21st century phenomena, but it's not. It's always been there in, in some way uh, expressing itself. And so Jesus is going to talk about how we as Christ followers should approach the subject of money um, or the accumulation of stuff in our lives. And so he's going to use the word treasure here. That can mean money in, in, in many contexts. That's what it means. But it's it's bigger than that. It's, you know, we're, we're storing up things. You know, the idea of treasure is you have treasure and you, you store it up and you, you put your treasure um, in a bank or you put your treasure in some place where people can't get to it. That's the imagery that Jesus is going for here when he talks about treasure. And again, it can be money, but it can be other things as well. Um, stuff that you and I may accumulate that has some type of earthly value. So here's what Jesus says. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, okay? Where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let's take a look at that. First of all, let's begin by saying, what is Jesus not prohibiting? He's not prohibiting private property or possessions. Okay? He's not saying that we should become destitute and that we should be like Francis of Assisi, and, and we give it all away, unless God speaks to you. But that's not what God is doing uh, through Jesus' words here, as recorded by Matthew. Uh, he's not saying that we shouldn't save for a rainy day, or that we shouldn't have life insurance. He's not condemning the fact that you might have possessions, you might be rich. Uh, in fact, in the United States, we are, even the poorest is rich by the world standards in terms of the things that we have access to. Okay. Jesus is not condemning that here. Okay. Now, the scripture talks about being rich. It does create problems. Now, let's define rich here. Rich is when I have much more than what I really need. Okay. Um, that's rich. Okay. Uh, if I got $100,000, uh, I'm a rich if I only need $75,000. If I need $150,000 to survive and I have $100,000, I'm not rich. You, you see, it's it's not the amount that is, is so predominant. It, the point is, is that do I have more that I need? Well, that can create problems, but he doesn't condemn it. He talks about the fact that it's hard. And it's difficult because we rely on our resources rather than relying on the, the, the provider of all of our resources, God himself. But he doesn't condemn it. In fact, scripture clearly praises the ant for storing in summer for the upcoming season, preparing for retirement, setting aside money uh, to be able to go uh, on vacation or, or build a memory with um, the grandkids or the great-grandkids. Okay, Jesus is not prohibiting these things. Uh, you know, Paul calls out those who do not provide for their family. Okay, I would say to you that um, most for most people, life insurance is almost a necessity, uh, not a large one. Because what happens uh, when you pass, if you 
put your family into a financial hole because of your medical bills and everything else, I'm not so sure you're being all that wise. Now, again, there are always exceptions to uh, these principles, but the point is, is that we need to provide for our family. We need to provide emotional support. We need to provide by our physical presence, you know, you know talk to them. You know, if we still have family at home, we need to provide uh, clothing, shelter whatever, to help others. And Paul says, if you don't do this, he says, you're worse than an infidel, which was strong language in the ancient world. And it's difficult to do these things when you're impoverished. So Jesus is not prohibiting the fact that we have some means. In fact, he had some rather wealthy people that support his ministry, some, some women that had means to be able to help him as he's doing his ministry. Paul ran into people and he stayed in their home, Priscilla and Aquila, and they had a home in Corinth and they later on had a home in Ephesus and they had a home in Rome. And these homes were large enough that the local church met in their home. Okay, never condemned because they were, they were, it was always as an opportunity. They saw their, their means to be able to help others. So Paul and his traveling entourage would stay with Priscilla and Aquila when he was in Ephesus or when he was in Corinth. All right. So they're not condemned because they have. Okay. And we are not to despise the things that we have when God blesses us, but we are to enjoy the things our Creator has given to us. You know, some of you had incredible ideas, and it led to the fact that you were able to establish trusts for your family. You were able to do things. That's great. But your goal, motivation, wasn't to accumulate stuff. If it was, then you're guilty of what Jesus was talking about. But in the course of you doing what God has prompted in your heart to do, and that is make a difference in your world, and you by chance, God blesses you with financial means, then realize that you have been blessed to be a blessing. And it begins first with your family. So what is Jesus forbidding? Well, he's condemning greed and the hoarding of money. See, we're to be drain pipes. You know the purpose of a drain pipe. It's to just channel the flow of water from off the roof down to the ground level. We are to be those that channel what God blesses us with, not to focus on accumulating more or hoarding it. See, the selfish accumulation of stuff or wanting more, not knowing contentment, that's what Jesus is forbidding as his followers, okay? Jesus said, and Luke records this, that life does not consist of the accumulation of stuff. <laughs> I, and in our materialistic world, the, that turns everything on its head. You know, it's how big can we have it? How much can we have? That becomes our motivation. Now, again, we got to go back. Jesus is not saying that having it is the problem. Is Was that our motivation, though? Is the motivation just about having a bigger pile of stuff? Jesus said life does not consist of that. Extravagant and luxurious living is not the way of God. He calls us to a life of simplicity. Hard-heartedness, which turns a blind eye to those in need because we can't really afford it because we got to take care of this this luxurious house that we bought that is 10 times bigger than what we need, okay? Now, if you can afford to do everything else and God's blessed you with a house that big, God bless you. Again, he's not condemning that. What's your motivation? What's your motivation? I'll say that over and over. We think that a person's life consists of what is accumulated, and Jesus said, no, life is not like that, but in our materialistic world, we tend to think that way. And this type of treasure, the stuff that is resulting from an attitude of greed or just 
hoarding and wanting more and more, that type of treasure fades and doesn't last. Okay? It gets destroyed over time. It gets eaten away. Okay? You know, for example, if I put $1,000 and I put it under my bed, and 10 years later, I go get that $1,000, will that $1,000 10 years later buy what it would have bought 10 years earlier? The answer is no. It's not because it actually got physically eaten. We call that inflation, right? Inflation. So what we pay for something today is different than what we paid for it 10 years ago. And so that $1,000, in essence, is slowly being eaten away. Okay? We need to invest it in the kingdom, in the things that matter most to God. That's investing it in people. Okay, investing it in our families, investing it in the kingdom things, being kind and generous to those that are in need. Okay, you know, back then houses were made of mud bricks and could be easily broken into. Okay, and so he's saying there is that if your goal and motivation is about accumulating and just hoarding, guess what? It's probably over time you're going to lose it. So rather than clutching the fist and holding on, let's be generous. Let's be generous. So what are we to pursue? Well, we are to pursue treasure that has eternal or heavenly value. See, money is not our destination. It's not our goal. It's merely a tool to, to do what God has called us to do. When I was 41 and was I was destitute, Okay, I was, had been a youth pastor, and I didn't have anything. And, and there were people that had needs around me, and I, I wanted to respond, and I didn't have anything because I had three kids at home and a wife. I said, Lord, I have no desire to be rich, but boy, I, I want to get to the point that I could respond to that need and not worry about what bill doesn't get paid. Okay? And can I tell you, God honored that. See, why? Did I make more money? Yeah, but my goal wasn't about making more money. My goal was I wanted to do make a difference. Now, I can't say I've been 100% pure in my motives, and I have to ask God to forgive me, but that was my motive at that point, and God honored that request, and he has blessed me beyond what I could ever imagine. Okay, it's a tool. It's a tool. Be able to help people go to the mission field, young people, young families that are feeling the call of God and, and they're trying to raise money and they don't have the means themselves and they're having to go and ask people. I, I respond whenever I can to those needs. Okay. Heavenly values. What does God value? When I use my resources for others, when I develop Christian character, when I'm growing in my faith, hope, and love, you know, it's all about being generous, being generous of forgiveness. That's laying up treasure in heaven. Okay. To take what God has given us, which is what I've been illustrating throughout this teaching today, and being able to be a blessing to others. We need to focus on things that have lasting value. It's people. It's about those who do not know you, lost souls. And so I support my local church or I support missions when I can. I make sure that when I give to an, a nonprofit that, that at least 90% of it is going towards the, their, their goal, their target uh, work. You know, right now we're in the midst of hurricane season and we've got two hurricanes that have come and there are people that desperately need it. If we have the means can we give to those things? But make sure you give to organizations that you know that are not spending it all on advertisement and salaries, but are actually, it's going to where it's supposed to go. So the key pr principle that Jesus is sharing in our thought for today is where your treasure is, there your heart will follow. It's an incredible, incredible concept. Yeah. Here's the deal. My father-in-law taught me this lesson many years ago. He just passed this 
earlier this summer. And, and uh, so every once in a while, I think about some of the things that I've, I've learned from my father-in-law through the years. And one of the things he, he, uh, he told me is that um, we had moved back home and we had taken a small startup church and my father in law and his wife were attending um, the, the big church in town. And, and so shortly after we got there, I started getting uh, every week uh, or every other week, a check from my father-in-law for the church. He knew that we were struggling. And so he was sending it. And the day came when he, in a conversation he had with my wife and I, he said, uh, Dwayne, he said, um, we're going to start attending your church. And I said, yeah, we would love to have you, but you don't need to do that. You, you've been more than generous already. And he says, um, I've learned the principle that when you start giving your money, your treasure, your time to something, the feelings and heart follow after it. And I thought, wow, that's the exact opposite of what we do in our world. We wait for the feelings to come and then we respond to needs. And that's not what Jesus is saying. He says, you, you want to have all the, that emotional, just start giving. Be a giver. Give your treasure. You want to fall in love with someone? Spend time with them. Give of your time. Get to know them. And over time, the feelings will come. See, we, are, we talk about falling in love. Well, you know, much of the world, they, you know, they still have arranged marriages. And you say, well, how does that work? That's because they were friends long before they were lovers. They, they, they spent time. They were committed to each other. And then all the feelings came. And in essence, the feelings become the caboose and not the engine that drives our relationships. So don't wait for the feelings to give. Give because you purpose in your heart and, and that's the right thing to do. You know, as I spend time with my family, as I, sp as I give to my family of my resources and everything else, the feelings will find their place. And when I give, all those nice pitter-patter motions that we have will follow that we all cherish so much in our lives. And this is true in all of our relationships. So where's our treasure? If our treasure is focused on the things that have temporary earthly value, that's where our attention, our affections will follow. But if we give to those things that have eternal value, as we give to those in need, as we, we give to and so help our family as we in and our motivation is geared towards bringing honor and glory to God, the things that matter to God. Then, our affections will follow. Our affections will follow, and so may we be people who give out of the right motivation. You know, I don't give. For the feelings, the feelings just are a byproduct of it. I give because I purpose in my heart. That's what would please God, first of all. And second, that's because the need is there and I see the need. I've been sensitized by the Holy Spirit to the need in that person's life and I respond. I might give a word of encouragement to them. I might just whisper a prayer for them. But I'm giving of what God has given me. Well, motivation. Jesus has been talking about what motivates us. And may our hearts be right here. May we give to things that have eternal value, that will last beyond the next year. It's kind of like, you know, if I have a choice between giving um, Star Wars stuff, to my grandkids, okay? They enjoy it, but there's gonna be a day when they won't play with it anymore and it won't have any meaning to them. But when I spend time with them, now I'm not a fisherman, but if I was, I, I'd be taking my grandkids fishing. There are things I do, I play sports still. 
still fairly athletic at my age. And so I get out there and I kick the ball with them. Okay. Why do I kick the ball? Because I want to show them how great a ball player I am? No, no. I just want to spend time with them. What do you think 20 years from now they're going to remember? Star Wars? Maybe. The time that Grandpa was able to spend with them? And that he was always there? Jesus is calling us to really think through how we spend our time. Is it about accumulating more or is it about saying, God, how can I, with what you bless me with, make a difference in my will? Father, thank you for your word. Lord, just keep my friends close to you. As they seek your face in prayer, Lord, as they are prompted to give, Lord, just give them wisdom so, Lord, they do what is pleasing to you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great, great day. We'll look forward to seeing you next week as we continue the sermon that turned the world upside down.